Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've got about uh, 75 participants right now, and we'll see how that uh, grows, uh, if it does, over, over time. Welcome to this morning's Grand Rounds on use of social media in neurosurgery. It's a really interesting and exciting topic. Uh, for those of you who are not part of our department, I usually start with a brief chair's corner as well as an introduction. Um, and I usually like to give, these days, I usually give an update on what's happening uh, in our hospital system with COVID. Uh, and as you can see the, uh, in the top right, the curve has definitely flattened. We're off the peak. Um, we currently have 550 cases admitted. Uh, these are COVID positive patients. And as you know, for a horrible period of more than 10 days, we were hovering around 2000 patients. These are really incredible numbers. Um, at one point we had 455 in intensive care and that is now down to 100 and 142. Uh, these are still really, really big numbers as Walter and I were just discussing. Uh, part of the reason the numbers have lingered is something that Dr. Mako was referring to before, uh, and that some patients enter a somewhat chronically uh, hypoxic ventilated dependent state and are difficult to wean. Uh, but another reason is that this is a bit of a trailing indicator and what you can see with this larger graph uh, it is much more optimistic and a really good number to see is the number of unique patients admitted with a positive a COVID positive diagnosis decreasing. Uh, we were up upwards of 250 a day admitted uh, at one point, and now we're down in the tens of patients. So this is all really good stuff. We are starting to operate again. Uh, last week, we and this week, we were doing about 15 open cases per week. This week alone, we are, we are doing eight or nine uh, cranies for brain tumor. So the tumors are, st are now starting to come back up and uh, the spine cases are also starting to come up as well over the next couple of weeks. We're still only at about 25% to 30% of what we should be doing and will be doing, but these are all really great promising numbers that are very, very optimistic. Uh, this is the scheme we're currently using for scheduled non-emergency cases, a tripod uh, with drivers of surgery being threat to function, a need for diagnosis and time dependent treatments. And the balance against doing the cases is whether the patient will use a lot of resources, how long they'll stay, et cetera, as well as the COVID risk. So these are the things that we're dealing with right now. Let's move on to a really fun topic today, a really interesting one. It's a pleasure to have a distinguished panel uh, with Walter Jean, uh, who is Professor of Neurosurgery at GW, uh, Director of Skull Based Surgery, and clearly an innovator and leader in adapting new technologies uh, and promoting them uh, in, in unique and very educational and sophisticated ways. You can see he's got a fantastic pedigree from Princeton, uh, Cornell uh, and uh, is really a leader. Great to have you uh, as part of the panel today. Thank you. Uh, Joe Lindsay, I got to know a little bit, you know, early on, uh, he, it was clear that he was going to be a leader in neurosurgery, even as a med student. And as you can see, he's uh, served as a social media editor for JNS since 2016, and he's just an intern now. Uh, and so we have been following you uh, quite a bit, Joseph, and that's, that's really great to have you with us. Uh, Leslie Schlachter is one of the foremost social media influencers in neurosurgery. Uh, she's clinical director and chief APP in our department. Uh, she joined us in 2015. I've had the real pleasure of working with her all this time. And as with everything she does, uh, she took on the concept of social media and has brought it to a really fantastic level. 
apparently she's got 19,000 followers. She's got to be one of the more uh, out there uh, people in neurosurgery. Um, we've got uh, other uh, distinguished members, Joe Ciavaro, Neha Dengais, Justin Singer, as part of the panel. So uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to, to you and we'll get started. All right, I think I will share my screen now. Let's hope that this all works well. Here we go, and away we go. Great, thank you, Dr. Bettison. Thank you for uh, inviting me to do this, and thank you for giving me a chance to not talk about COVID. Uh, um, I think I'm not unique in uh, saying that this is a happy topic and no more uh, morbid topics for now. Let's have a good day and a good time, at least uh, uh, with this talk. My talk, uh, Social Media and the Neurosurgeon, Ladies and Dangerous, or Love Actually. Uh, if you don't know that what the title was all about, Les Liaisons Dangerous is a book from uh, old uh, French um, uh, tradition and was adapted to Broadway and, of course, the big screen. It was uh, most recently The Dangerous Liaisons with Glenn Close, John Malkovich, and Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, and uh, interestingly, Glenn Close was in the modern adaptation of the same story which is fatal attraction, and who will ever forget that rabbit scene? If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go watch the movie, do not bring a date. Um, Love Actually, of course, is a sappy little Hugh Grant uh, uh, rom-com, so uh, we're gonna talk about whether this uh, uh, social media is for us, which one of these. Disclosure, I have none relevant, except to say that I belong to a two social media doc family, so we are always posting our children, are in fact, raised by wolves. Um, my wife uses it more for social uh, advocacy and um, me much uh, less uh, heavy topics. Um, this is not a slide about COVID. Uh, this is in fact the 2016 uh, users of Facebook. Um, and uh, if this were COVID, 1.6 billion people would be affected. Uh, so you can see that uh, if COVID changed the world, then social media certainly has in the last decade, if not more. 20% uh, of the world's population is using Facebook as of several years ago. The hollow spots you can see on the map are China, Russia, and North Korea. Twitter, uh, this is a slide courtesy of Chris Gra Graffio. Uh, the second largest uh, social media platform with uh, more than 10,000 tweets per second, and only half of them are from Donald Trump. Uh, so these two are big platforms and they are definitely changing the world. Why should we be in love with this? Uh, it is a tool, it is the biggest soapbox in the world. It is the uh, new universal uh, way of uh, showing uh, your work. Um, and if you're gonna write and publish papers, then you certainly want people to read them, otherwise why bother writing them? So this is a way to show the world your work and your skills. It is free, no one has to pay anything for it. You don't have to be rich to, to get on and use these platforms to show your work. You can, uh, of course, uh, everybody in some sort of way is uh, recruiting patients. So it is a very good marketing tool. And also if you're a department and you're, you, got your, your, you have to have residency candidates and faculty candidates, it is the best way to show off. It is a great way to show off your department, its achievements uh, and all the good things you're doing for job seekers. So marketing is one big category why we should be in love with it. Okay, well, here you go. Uh, I recently created a book and you know, here's a page on Facebook that allows me to do the marketing again. If I bother creating it, why well, put it in the warehouse? You want people to read it. Networking is this big second category why uh, social media is great for neurosurgeons. You find colleagues to collaborate with. Uh, if you have doing global studies, like I like to do global neurosurgery studies, uh, social media is critical in recruiting subjects and uh, it is a great way to educate the world. So networking is uh, big. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest networking groups on Facebook. Uh, they have more than uh, five digit uh, membership and um, run very successfully. Uh, and I wanna give them a little shout out here, uh, Neurosurgery Cocktail. 
The final category, which is a very important one, uh, even though it's a short slide, is staying current. Is the newspaper is the best way to stay current on what uh, your subspecialty uh, is churning out and what new uh, things are out there and stay current with the literature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there, are all the, there are all kinds of naysayers. I have a lot of friends who are not at all present on social media, and these are the things that they're always concerned about. Uh, hey, I'm going to put something on there that's going to violate HIPAA, especially if I'm posting professional things up there. I'm going to jeopardize my own security and privacy. Uh, that certainly is a concern. Uh, we have all know people who have probably been hacked uh, and uh, you may even gain a stalker. I, I remember having a resident when I was program director uh, who was getting stalked by one of the people in the hospital uh, of unknown identity on Facebook. And that was a concern and she's had to shut it down. Uh, the other thing is that I've got nothing to say. Well, you've got nothing to say. That's pretty unusual for a neurosurgeon, first of all, and I could Academia, especially uh, everybody has something to say. So find something to say, I'm sure. And then finally, self-promotion is just gauche. Um, I used to subscribe to that, but obviously I'm no longer a believer in that statement. Uh, and I think you can, you can always uh, promote your own work without being tasteless uh, out there. So those are the reasons that I hear about people not being on social media at all. Now, my own pers personal perspective I'll give you about social media, and I'm talking about purely on my professional side. I have personal um, accounts on all these platforms, but I'm really only talking about the uh, professional side where you talk about your work and talk about your, uh, your, your academic achievement. And this is not about the personal side where I post things such as this. Uh, if you can't read the slide, I said, I've been promoted. I am now the chair, uh, the Adrian Jean chair of the dinner table. Um, so professional uh, platforms. The reason why I started using social media is because I have a website and I wanted to drive traffic there. Uh, the, the theory is that uh, if you have more hits on your website, you will come up sooner on Google searches or higher up on the Google searches. So social media was used, uh, I guess years ago, to drive traffic to a website so that when you have more hits, you can uh, be more prominent on Google. So with that, I started a uh, a Twitter pay, a Twitter uh, account, and I called myself a persona called Shifu. Uh, by the way, Shifu does not necessarily mean master, which is uh, in, in Kung Fu Panda. Uh, it simply in Chinese means teacher. So um, there was my persona on on Twitter, and then I also posted started posting videos on on Facebook, uh, talking about neurosurgical technique, and here you see me cutting right into the vein of Galen. Uh, anyway, so I started doing all that to again with the primary goal of trying to drive more traffic to the, uh, to the website. Now, something happened very curiously, and that is that uh, several people started asking me questions about some of these videos. And in the middle here, you see Dr. Ngo from uh, Hanoi, Vietnam, who started the conversation with me uh, on one of my videos. And lo and behold, that led to many, many good things. Uh, you see us uh, in Hanoi, um, which is the first thing it led to. Uh, we uh, did a mission uh, in Hanoi with him. And then that mission then led to not one, not two, I sound like LeBron James, but uh, a lot of publications that were generated from his data. Turns out that he has uh, trouble writing and we have no trouble writing and, and we collaborated wonderfully with him and uh, actually got him to uh, a platform uh, in Beijing for the World Fed. So, uh, so from just posting videos on Facebook, it led to a number of good things related to this uh, physician in Vietnam and, uh, and uh, got him a, a platform as well. And, and so we all benefited from this relationship. From that beginning, uh, I have now these numbers from uh, yesterday. Uh, I am nowhere near 19,000 followers like Leslie has on Instagram. What I've chosen to do is be pretty even across the platforms and not choose one in particular, which most people do. Uh, I found that with that, um, internationally, people know my work more than at home. Uh, and uh, that's an interesting phenomenon. The other thing that it gained me was the capability of doing global neurosurgery research. You see these two papers, <laughs> one of, uh, ironically on COVID, 
uh, where we had uh, one study had 797 respondents internationally, another one more than 500 for the two phases. So without uh, social media and a, a presence on, on social media, that would be absolutely impossible. And it is only because of that uh, following that I was able to uh, have the uh, uh, respondents for these survey studies. It does gain you some ugly stuff too, though. Here's a... Uh, uh, one of the more unpleasant uh, social media encounters uh, because of a um, mission in Panama with this ginormous tumor, I had a uh, rather negative comment on my page. And you know, you have to be ready to deal with that. Uh, with the positives, inevitably, you will come up with some negatives and uh, you need to have a plan of how to take that down or uh, mitigate its uh, uh, ramifications. Big four social media platforms here are my views on what they are all about. I'm running out of time here. Uh, Facebook is the Volvo. It is uh, safe and uh, boxy. Uh, old fashioned now getting a little bit. Uh, Inst Instagram is much more the Mini Cooper. It is the hip and in thing. Uh, Leslie is the expert on, on that platform. It is uh, certainly uh, with younger audiences very popular. Twitter is the Kawasaki, it's fast and brief telegraphs, uh, and it's the epicenter of neurosurgery social media, according to uh, certain uh, folks. And uh, LinkedIn is the Lincoln Town Car, and I, again, is, I'm pretty spread evenly across the four platforms. Um, post shares and uh, retweets, there are only six. Now, this is kind of like George Carlin condensing Ten Commandments into two. Uh, they are only really six, and I'll show you uh, why I think that. By the way, they're not mutually exclusive. They do uh, bleed into each other a little bit. So what do we see neurosurgeons posting out there? One is general, qu genuine questions. You'll find that this is extremely rare. What do I do with the case? Uh, the other category I say, I, I call it, I care, so so should you. These are like the news uh, things that happen and uh, things happening around the world, papers that they read and think that they sh everybody should know about. Then comes the brag. There is the humble brag, which is like here. Hey, I've done more AVMs than uh, you, you have time to read War and Peace 163 times. Uh, and then there's the not so humble brag, like uh, some of us put out there. Here's a big tumor. Look at how good I am taking it out. That's okay. Once in a while, I, I do that, I guess. The morale boosters are the little kittens and the pictures of your children playing. Everybody feels happy. And on, in this day and age, of course, the morale booster is all the more important. Uh, and here you go, morale booster. Here we went to play softball and look who I ran into. We, got, we had a great time. Uh, what a great memory. Announcements and adverts, these are pretty self-explanatory. And then the final category are rants. These are really, really fun to read sometimes, like drinking Lysol is good for you and so on and so forth. Uh, now, what about these six and how are they spread over the platforms? Um, I did a study, a very informal one. How, did, how are these six uh, uh, kinds of posts spread across the platform? Inclusion criteria, posts or retweets shared by neurosurgeons or neurosurgical societies and institutes uh, and have an N of 100 across the platforms. Uh, exclusion, retweets without comments or just likes or non-English posts that are too hard to, un to understand for me. Look at Facebook. 24% of neurosurgical posts on Facebook is about is our rants. And this is the highest rant proportion on all four platforms. Uh, Instagram, not surprisingly, is all about cute kittens and sunsets and uh, margaritas here. Look look at uh, how good a time we had, and you will have one too. Twitter, uh, you have the, the most I care, so so should you sort of posts. Like, here's an important piece of news. Please read uh, along with me. And in LinkedIn, because of the professionalism of the platform, it more like it is the highest percentage for the BRAC category, which is here is what I did. You should learn how to do this yourself. Now, uh, this is the overall, and you can see that the big, biggest use uh, for all four platforms is the morale booster uh, here, feel good. Now, this is of course done in the period of COVID, so that might be the reason for that. For my personal, I didn't do a study on my personal post. I try to be funny out there. Uh, this says tiger test positive during master's week. Uh, and this says uh, that uh, my son is using the shovel to, sh to, to, uh, to fence. Uh, 
a ha ho ha ha god turn peri dot spin boing if you're over 45 and know the reference put it here it's daffy duck um so I, ju I just try to be funny and hopefully, um, um, you know, gain some followers and talk about my work occasionally. Uh, 10 golden rules. This is adopted from Chris Graffio, again, the social media editor of JNS and uh, NASBS. I thank him for these slides. I adapted, I, I of course, edited uh, some of it. Don't violate HIPAA. Don't post anything that could be used against you. Yeah, people can use all kinds, you can twist your words and twist your posts uh pictures uh in in compromising positions please don't do that uh make sure no one uh, uses that against you don't post about your kids with location of cues that would threaten their safety um violate privacy of others obviously is a bad idea don't you know take a post and reshare for to, to some people that they shouldn't see uh don't make the world roll their eyes now this is from a friend so i'm going to post it with a caveat this is from a friend uh, and but uh, nevertheless, friends can post eye rollers too. Look at my new Louis Vuitton briefcase. Who were better? To, um, now you know for, for those of us earning minimum wage, maybe you know the fact that you have a very expensive briefcase is not the most uh, tasteful thing to post out there. But anyway, it was definitely an eye roller. The do side do consider all the interpretations of your. Words, again, this has to be uh, related to people twisting it and then using it against you. Do keep it professional. And this is, again, the professional side of your platforms. Uh, no one needs to see these on your professional sides, okay? It tells people that you're, you're drunk, you're, 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 you're a pig, and then you're a psycho. Uh, this is on my personal side. I would never put that on my professional side. Uh, so do keep it professional. Do broadcast your work. That's after you all while you write. Uh, do be funny. Uh, I think this is a, a, a key thing. This is me playing my six-year-old on Jenga. And you can see that I'm telling myself that I really should be not so neglectful of the backside of the operation and focused on, oh dear. So uh, I think that's very helpful. And uh, do be kind. Now, here's again another thing from a friend that I'm going to unfortunately embarrass uh, him about. This was a Lancet article about how post-operative uh, period kills people in uh, LMICs and uh, global neurosurgery. And he says, this is bananas interpretation of data. It's what happens when you teach medical students how to memorize the Krebs cycle and not how to read a journal. And then people just jump on, of course, like ban surgery, ban antibiotics, all of them lead to death. 90% of all death globally occur 30 days after antibiotic treatment. And I had to come and be a referee and say, hey, this is not about who to blame. It's about a disparity in the LMICs uh, and uh, so on. So mean tweets may be not so, not so good. Uh, social media has a memory and people can uh, maybe use that against you later. So in conclusion, uh, with my 20 minutes, uh, is it good or is it bad? You can, you can sense where I'm going with it. it is your inst if, if you're an institution or organization or department, you'd be silly not to use it. Uh, it is the best way to show off your department, its work, recruit uh, new uh, job seekers. And there is no one who does this better than Mount Sinai. Uh, you have a professional staff manning it uh, all the time and do a wonderful job with your social media presence. For people, it is your persona in the 21st century. We'd like to talk about VR, both Mount Sinai and GW. This is your avatar. This is your avatar to the world. This is how you're gonna stay current. This is how you're gonna show the world your face. And talking about newspapers staying informed, democracy dies in darkness is the motto of the Washington Post. Uh, and I would also add that your knowledge, your opinions, your skills, your, your experiences die in darkness as well. So uh, by all means, use it and use it in a tasteful sort of way. And if you have kids that like mine, there's no reason not to show them off a little bit to the world once in a blue moon. So uh, with that, I know uh, I, I probably went over, but I had, I guess, lots to say. I didn't realize. Um, so uh, that ends my part of it. And I'm going to turn it over to, I believe, uh, Joseph. Uh, that timing was perfect. You had you have until you actually have two minutes until eight twenty five. Oh, so okay. So we, I, we could take a minute to answer a question from the audience if someone raises their hand and has a question or post in the QA box. And I also have a question for you, Walter. How much time do you spend uh, doing this, and how do you manage it? Because it's it's a very impressive effort that you're making. Very well rounded and well thought out. It was a beautiful presentation. So tell us how you manage this. 
with your the rest of your professional life? Uh, that is my God. That's an excellent question because, uh, you, as with everything, you you try to proportion your your lives um, according to the importance of the endeavor. You know, let's say they have a really really unique case that I want to show, and I know that none of the journals are going to take it. Uh, I think there's a place for it putting it on social media with HIPAA with HIPAA uh, you know compliance. Um, so I go and edit the video and I put a little post together and I, I show it. Uh, it does take time, but if the case is unique enough and has enough teaching value, I think, and, and no one else is going to take it, obviously, this will be, this is a very good, good place. So you do have to manage it according to the importance of the endeavor, just like everything else we do in our professional lives, but it does take a lot of time. Um, and uh, uh, again, I, I say that I'm a two household a social media household. Look, my, my wife just did a campaign uh, with a couple of other pediatricians in, in Panama to free the children in Panama from COVID uh, quarantine. Uh, and uh, they spent uh, an evening, the entire evening doing doing this and they were able, they were successful. They, they released all the kids from the quarantine. Uh, so again, you, it's important you spend the time and you try to manage it as best as you can. Thank you. Okay, Joseph Lindsay. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. So I'll share my screen. Um, so I wanted to talk just briefly about uh, Twitter for the neurosurgeon from a resident's perspective. Um, this talk is probably geared a little bit more towards medical students and residents who are interested in neurosurgery and getting involved with social media. Um, but I, I have a lot, a lot less experience than Dr. Jean with this. Um, but I, I, I put um, four reasons why I think that uh, Twitter is especially important for people who are um, interested in neurosurgery. Um, the first one being the ability to create strength and connections, to establish a narrative, um, to educate others and to gain education yourself um, and to disseminate research. So to illustrate the first one, honestly, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about my first um, real experience with uh, social media. So I, back in 2017, uh, a friend convinced me to get a Twitter and I was doing a, um, a neurosurgery exploratory as a med student. I was sitting in the ICU really late at night um, and all of a sudden I saw this tweet uh, from someone at Mount Sinai and uh, just showing off some of the cool 3D printing that was happening. And in one of my first tweets out, um, you know, I complimented the model. They had said that they were going to be shown at the 2017 AANS. And I thought, well, I might as well try to interact with uh, someone uh, on this and see, see what Twitter is all about. And within minutes, um, the Department of Neurosurgery uh, Twitter account at Mount Sinai uh, responded to me, uh, started kind of describing how I could actually attend the, the symposium and how I could sign up for it. And as a med student, I thought it was amazing that, that, that a, you know, a, a Department of Neurosurgery was reaching out to me as, as a med student and uh, trying to get me more involved. And so you know, I, was, I was feeling pretty good. I was, I was elated, really. Um, and then all of a sudden, Dr. Mako, uh, just minutes later, sent me a, a, a tweet that said that he hoped that I could attend. And I, at that point, was still very new to neurosurgery and the neurosurgery politics, but I knew enough to know that Dr. Mako was a huge deal in cerebral vascular neurosurgery, uh, which is what I, as a med student, thought I was going to be interested in. Um, and I, again, as a med student, I was thinking this is, this Twitter thing is really amazing. I just for a few months have been involved, but then all of a sudden I'm talking to Dr. Mako uh, and he's hoping that I go to this, this symposium. So I registered for the symposium and the double NS came uh, and I had a chance to go to the symposium. And it was amazing. Again, I was, a, I think, a second or third year medical student at the time. And I walk into this room uh, in Los Angeles, and Leslie, 
uh, Jamie, uh, Dr. Mako, a, a number of the people who I had been begun interacting with on Twitter um, came right up to me and said, oh, you're that med student. I remember you from Twitter. Here, let me show you this model. Let me show you uh, uh, the, the surgical theater, this virtual reality. Um, I think it was Leslie took me aside and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to interview you. We're going to uh, film you for a few minutes, ask you a few questions, and we'll, we'll post it. How does that sound? And I mean, I was, I was floored um, at how gracious people were, were being and uh, how, what, what a cool experience I was having uh, because of Twitter. Uh, a little later in the, in the conference, um, Dr. Mako is presenting something about this endoscopic evacuation of intracerebral hemorrhage. I posted it. He sits down, uh, and I got and I got a tweet from him. For from a from a med student standpoint, um, I was kind of on cloud nine. They invited me to um, you know their their resident get together, and I felt like I was part. of the team. When I went and interviewed there uh, during um, interview season, I, I felt like I was coming back almost like my home institution where I knew people. I came in, I, I, I knew a handful of the residents, I knew the faculty, I knew a handful of the PAs. Um, Mount Sinai was the first, uh, first group of people to congratulate me after I, I uh, matched a neurosurgeon. Um, for me, uh, the, the ability to use Twitter to begin to make connections in neurosurgery is second to none. And, and the Department of Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai uh, was really my first introduction to that and one of the best examples of being able to start building kind of a, a community outside of uh, your home institution. In a, in a very unique way that I, I'd never really experienced. Um, so it, even outside of that, building this nice community of people that you feel really comfortable with and you can see at all these meetings, um, being able to, from a medical student or from a resident standpoint, neurosurgery is extremely hierarchical and Twitter allows you to uh, push that hierarchy down and begin to expand and learn from people outside of your home institution. Uh, the, bil the ability to interact with, with masters in, in tumor and vascular and spine uh, in a very low stress environment where uh, the communication is very uh, low stakes. It also gives you an opportunity to mentor younger residents and medical students like I, I was at that time and, and still am as a, as a first year. And again, I think that it's key uh, for people who are going to these big CNS, WNS meetings for the first time, being able to establish some connections uh, online and then translating those to the meetings where you can meet people and actually uh, interact. There's been many times where people have said, oh, I recognize your picture from Twitter. You're, you're uh, the one who's on, on Twitter. And, and, and that started a conversation that's led to other things. Um, my second, my second kind of reason establishing a narrative, and, and Dr. Jean uh, pointed this out very, very well. Uh, in this day and era, the public are going to be googling, uh, even as residents, people people Google names, and you want to make sure that the the first things that people read are things that you've personally curated and. Uh, established as what you want to be said about you. You're able to really create a very personal and strong narrative about what you're interested in and the niches that you have. Again, Mount Sinai is, is probably one of the best examples of a department that's been able to do that. Um, but at an individual level, you're able to begin um, you know, posting de-identified pictures or videos um, studies, all those things that allow people to see your track record of interest in a certain field or topic, um, and you're able to kind of begin to build your brands. Again, from, from a resident or a resident. 
from, again, from a resident or medical student standpoint, uh, the ability to not only educate others, but to receive education um, via Twitter and Instagram is huge, especially in this COVID era where a lot of the in-person meetings are uh, stopped. All, there, there are webinars, virtual um, meetings, and you know, a, a number of groups are, are creating these wonderful 3D models that you can use to look at anatomy. And all of those things allow, uh, are propagated through social media and being involved in social media allows you to stay on the forefront of those um, and, and also be able to get involved in helping develop them. Research dissemination. Hey Joseph, just um, like, you know, one minute, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, being able to send out both research for yourself and others is, is key. Um, I'll just quickly say, I think um, these are all important. I think for a, a, a resident, that one of the biggest things is the ability to begin getting involved with organized neurosurgery through, uh, through social media and being able to volunteer on, on their boards uh, is, is huge. Um, this was all talked about by, by Dr. Jean, so I won't re-go over it, but being HIPAA compliant is huge. Um, and again, I just want to thank the Department of Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai for giving me the opportunity to speak and for um, really helping me gain my footing in social media at the very beginning. Well, thank you, Joseph. Uh, that was a brilliant talk. Uh, gives us a very unique point of view from a resident standpoint. Uh, let's uh, go to Leslie uh, for the next portion. Are you seeing screen one or screen two here? We're seeing you. You're not seeing my screen yet? about now good okay oh so, we, we're in presenter view though let's see i have a double screen it's not letting me switch my screen somehow mm. okay but we can see your slides yes okay okay so um, I, I think I'm gonna go through a little, probably a little bit more granular than um, everyone else has so far. So um, when you're starting off on social media, um, you got it, the first thing you have to be aware of, of what your money makers are. And I was aware of my money makers a year before I even started social media, just joining neurosurgery and Dr. Betterson's practice. So here on my screen, you see, this is what I consider to be my money makers. Uh, Dr. Betterson being my, my biggest money maker as an incredible world renowned neurosurgeon and um, one of the best in his field of skull based surgery. So it's pretty simple to kind of jump under his wing and, and ride that wave with him. And um, within our arena, we usually go everywhere together. So we're able to capture a lot of that. I also am very lucky to be able to have access to a lot of incredible technology, colorful simulations, navigated surgery, which we can capture pretty simply in our workflow. So a lot of our colorful technology representations are easy to show. And then myself as a physician assistant and feeling pretty comfortable getting out there and chatting with the world, um, I'm able to connect with, with colleagues. So connecting with the world of neurosurgery, physician assistants, um, the technology advanced neurosurgery that's out there, that's kind of where my goal was when I started. And you know, if this was a stock market trend, you would look at this and say, yeah, I should have gotten back in this in 2010, but this is still rising. So anyone who is kind of a naysayer for joining social media cannot deny that this, this is happening. So, so why did I jo uh, join social media? A couple years ago, um, our marketing coordinator, uh, Jillian Barroza, had a meeting with Dr. Betterson and I and said, hey, listen, central marketing really wants us to get involved with social media. Are you guys interested? 
And Dr. Betterson said, oh, not yet. Why don't you, why don't you give it a go and tell me how it goes? So at that point, Jillian named me Brainy Leslie as a play on um, neurosurgery and hopefully being smart. And I wanted to jump right in and, and be an early adapter. I am, I've been at Mount Sinai for almost 12 years. I love Mount Sinai. I love medicine. So um, building a, a brand, um, a concierge specialty level brand was something that was important to me. It was also very important to raise awareness for Dr. Betterson and all of his strong work and um, for APPs and myself. I love to educate patients. Everyone who knows me in my practice knows that engaging patients and giving them a top level experience is very important. Um, I love collaborating with other doctors, as you can see here. You know, Walter and I met several years ago on Instagram and here we are today. Same thing with uh, Joseph Lindsay. You know, you are also building authority. You can be one of the best in your field in the middle of Kansas, but if nobody knows it, not that it doesn't matter, just nobody knows it. And um, I found that this has provided a lot of support. So I wanted to be able to reach out and, and pro provide that support. And I love being social. So which platform? These platforms that you see here from Facebook to Twitter to Reddit, a lot of them are not outward engaging platforms like WhatsApp or Facebook, um, like WhatsApp or um, Pinterest. You know, they're, they're not exactly what we're looking for here in neurosurgery, but you know, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Doximity, these are more outward engaging platforms. So you kind of have to feel out what works for you. I would say the majority of medical practitioners focus on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Doximity. So um, when I started uh, about three years ago, I just knew I wanted to um, kind of talk about Dr. Betterson and I, our practice, neurosurgery, physician assistants and nurse practitioners, and I wanted it to be colorful. And I, these snapshots that you see here are kind of a good representation of what I've done throughout the years. I kind of mix it up between standard black and white DICOMs showing cases, CAT scans, MRIs, um, before a case even starts. I like my colorful representations of simulations or um, navigated surgeries, as well as intraoperative pictures, as you can see here. And um, anyone who's ever interacted with me at Mount Sinai Hospital knows that I am a generally pretty happy, fun-loving, super social person. And I wanted that to shine across through my social media and um, that you see here. Um, I want you to take a look at the middle screen and that says, you know, I found throughout the years, there's the things that people ask me over and over again, I kind of got sick of answering. So I just put it up there. Yes, I'm 6'4". And for those internationally, that's 193 centimeters. Um, I work at Mount Sinai Neurosurgery. I specialize in skull-based surgery with Dr. Betterson, but people get confused by the term skull-based. So I switched it to brain. It's fine. They can also find me on these other platforms, which I'm not as active in. I do focus on Instagram. And you can see that my profile is a public figure profile. If you're not, if you don't have a public figure profile, you cannot engage with your insights. We'll talk about insights in just a moment. But it's important that you, you manage your profile appropriately, that people can find out all about you just in one second of looking at your profile. And then where you see the, um, your link where it says Zoom, I put that up today or yesterday so people can join us here, but that can change. So does this work? Well, here's a group of people in our department. There's me in the longest line. Clearly this is working. The other pink arrows that you see are other people in our department um, that I have either kind of nudged, helped along, started their profiles, handed it off to them or something. So clearly this is all working and I, maybe I know what I'm doing. So I think, I think this is definitely um, heading in the right direction. So when you start your profile, you wanna, you have to be comfortable showing your face. Nobody's gonna connect with you if you can't show your face and stick to your specialty. So if you only wanna do hip replacements, you really shouldn't be talking about shoulders or feet, focus on hips. Same thing with us, with skull base. I definitely tweet about my teammates, but I, I try and stay focused. Do not start a profile until you have a ton of content ready to go. Because if you start your profile and then get busy for two weeks and the only post you put up was one post, followers are going to burn that in their memory that they can't really rely on you for content and they may not follow you moving forward. So be ready and then post cons like consecutively over a couple weeks because you are able to draft. Block your schedule just like you would with block time or office hours. You got to block it and be prepared for this. It does take 
a lot of effort up front, but once you build your competence, the time frame decreases so you're not as busy during the day. And you wanna to commit to those posts every week. Then keep your momentum going. You gotta to get to know your followers. Look at what they say, answer their DMs. You wanna keep it basic. You may be able to do an incredible, you know, you know, T1 to pelvis surgery, but people may wanna hear more about, you know, what you do with your team on a daily basis. You wanna post, you know, the basic stuff and every now and then throw in something complicated so people know you're pretty great. Post wherever you are, home, conferences, announce it all. You want to ask questions. Even if you know the answer, ask the questions. That's, way, that's the way that you engage with the younger audience. And you want to teach. Probably the most important thing is show your team who you engage with. People get bored even looking at beautiful Kim Kardashian. They don't want to see her all the time. They want to see who she engages with. So you want to show that. So here's an example of what I said, what I was talking about before. You can see, if you look over my last two years, this is my how I'm able to see my insights as a public figure. And when I click on engagement, which is the most important to me, I can see over the last two years, you don't see a lot of complicated neurosurgery here. You see my team, all right? My team connecting, talking, supporting each other. So I, I got this, this, this comment here recently from a teenager. The posts that educate your followers and elevate you are not the same posts that stimulate and excite your followers. Your followers want to see your team, you know, maybe what you had for breakfast that day, how you feel about being a busy neurosurgeon or a busy doctor. That's what they want to see. And that's what's going to get them to follow you and like you. But you can throw in that intermittent, really incredible complex neurosurgery that you think is the most meaningful. So they're two totally separate things. Chris, I know I have a minute. So here's an example of my most engaged post. I never saw, I never thought I would see this coming. This is a post um, where I had a patient who had uh, visual changes. She had an MRI that was completely normal, but I looked back in her system and I saw that she had had what I thought was a pituitary tumor a couple years ago. And I thought, huh, that's weird. Where did that go? Turns out she was just pregnant during that time. So I posted it. Hey, this is what it looks like during pregnancy. And this was my most engaged neurosurgery post. Out of all the complicated neurosurgeries that we've posted, this was it. So it just shows you how basic you can be. And now I want to show you um, a video here. So here we see um, these are the two most watched videos I've ever posted. And they're not even, this one's not even mine. Dr. George Juana, a neurootologist, post CSF coming out of a tympanic membrane. Everyone loved this. So, you know, it's not exactly what you think. And this is another video of Dr. Betterson performing a Valsalva technique after opening up the dura on a pituitary tumor. And with just Valsalva technique alone, you see the tumor coming out. So return on investment, return on investment, don't expect any. Expect no return, just be present because the, the general public thinks that if you're not there, you're not any good. We know that's not true, but just be there. And then the obvious stuff, you know, patients will connect with you, referring doctors, speaking engagements, networking, um, branding yourself, hiring neurosurgeons, connecting with people. Um, we said before, this is how we met Walter and Joseph. Um, it completely impacted our COVID outreach. We were able to collect thousands and thousands of dollars worth of food and PPE to support our team. This was directly through social media. Um, don't post PHI by accident. Check your posts at every angle, specifically reflections, mirrors, and screens. Do not oversell yourself. If you don't do diagnosis X, don't talk about it because then comments are going to start coming. You can't answer. And don't sexualize yourself. Leave that for the Kardashians. Nobody wants to see that in medicine. So I could easily post that picture of me. That's me, messy hair, sweatshirt on, absolutely no makeup, but I'm posing. I don't need to do that. Turns out that my followers, do you know what they want to see? 30,000 followers wanted to see me sitting at work in my messy office with no makeup on, smiling because I'm happy. So I'm going to stick to who I am and I'm not going to pose. And it seems to be working just fine for me. Well, thank you for that, Leslie. Uh, wonderful. Another completely unique perspective. Uh, again, uh, thank you for that uh, expertise in this. Instagram, my God, you're miles ahead of all of us uh, in terms of uh, knowing the nuances of what to post and, and all those uh, 
aspect. Um, so we, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to make sure to bring in the panelists who haven't been able to speak. Uh, Justin and Neha, um, you guys uh, didn't have formal talks, but uh, how, reactions towards what, uh, what's been said? All fantastic talks. And uh, I should uh, emphasize that I was pretty worried of getting on social media. I, I chose my platform to be Twitter. I'm not as facile as uh, you are, Walter, across all the different platforms, but I've been, I've been choosing more professional platforms because I do want to keep my social media presence uh, predominantly professional. So I don't use social media as much for, uh, for a personal profile. And all of the things that all three of you hit upon, whether it's networking, whether it's building your brand, whether it's getting your message out there, establishing research collaborations. I have a formal uh, grant and research collaboration through, through my networking on social media. Uh, I became vice chair of the Society of Critical Care Medicine Social Media Committee through engagement from social media. Found a lot of mentorship so that, that micro mentoring that happens in a very organic fashion on social media all three of you touched upon that very nicely. And it works, it provides, uh, uh, like Joseph was saying, it provides uh, direct access to masters in their fields, whether it's, it's your research collaborators, whether it's folks who've, who've uh, really established themselves as authorities in a very low stress environment, and you're able to really make, make those connections or your mission to Hanoi. It's, it's incredible how powerful social media is as a platform. And just like anything that's powerful, being very responsible in how we leverage its power and the connectivity that it, it brings um, is, is unparalleled. So I would urge every academician, every clinician, every clinician educator, researcher to really think of this as a very important avenue for reaching an audience that you already knew you wanted to reach, but so much beyond uh, reaching to an audience or inspiring people who you would have never had the chance to meet uh, hashtag in real life. Absolutely. Can entirely agree. Justin, your thoughts? Yeah, I think my initial experience with social media was at the end of training when I was um, getting curious about exploring job opportunities and networking beyond um, that realm. And then I started to recognize the power of uh, branding that you have and the way that you can share content, disseminate information, of course, learn and network with the masters, such as Neha's indicating. And then I think um, early uh, career for me, one of the um, early NS meetings I went to um, after posting a little bit on um, Twitter and LinkedIn, started meeting people who had seen things that I had done and I had seen things they had done that we otherwise would have never encountered or engaged with. So this um, sort of connectivity um, between uh, a global neurosurgery community or an uh, endovascular community that otherwise I would not have um, very much been a part of. I think uh, I have um, some experience posting on all um, platforms um, like you, Walter, and I was kind of curious. Um, I curate content slightly differently amongst um, all of them because I feel like the audiences are different. And I was um, curious about your perspective of that. I, I feel like Facebook, particularly if you have a, pro a professional page, is more patient or community-centered um, there can be an element of that being um, also for your neurosurgery community, but I target different audiences uh, differently based off of the platforms that I'm using. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on that. Well, I'll answer that very quickly. Uh, I think you're entirely correct. I, I, if I were to do it all over again from the beginning, I wonder whether I would have just stuck, you know, stick with one platform, like a, a, a just going Twitter or, or being like Leslie, being absolutely uh, expert in one particular platform, Instagram, and not use everything else. Uh, I kind of fell into the balanced act uh, in the four platforms and, and, and kind of ran with it. Uh, what I've, I found exactly, as you, you, you said, uh, different platforms at different and target audiences. And if you have something quick to say, maybe Twitter is the best way to do it. You have something very pictorial uh, to express, maybe Instagram is the best way to do it. Uh, and then LinkedIn for, is very, very professional and that's much more reserved uh, for that. So each each platform has its plus and minuses and, and strengths and weaknesses. And uh, I, I still don't know what the right thing to do is if you were to start, whether you should cone in on just one or, or, or another. I do want to touch on one topic that we have discuss today and that is censorship uh, um you know, First Amendment kind of uh, things. Uh, institutions uh, have uh, uh, some power in, in, in controlling what we what we say as professionals. Uh, has anybody run into an issue like that? I believe that we, we 
uh, we have some issues with Mount Sinai being an institution institution that have some sort of a control over the the content that you can or cannot post. Is that correct, um, folks from Sinai? Yes, that is correct. Uh, but what's interesting is that I tend to be the censor more than Sinai does, um, and I I think it's so important to. Um, I think you said it, I think everyone has said it, to listen to the audience uh, or people who are, you know, uh, in your local environment. A good example is that when the COVID started, we were all kind of worried and we thought maybe it'd be fun to pose, to have a, a weekly exercise competition. Uh, and the comments were, you know, it's so serious. Do you really want to be doing something so lighthearted? Um, so yes, we do get, you know, we do for videos, we have to have approval and every now and then there'll be something that we comment on, but I find that we're more on the reserve side of things than, than our institution. Leslie, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my personality is definitely not typical of, in neurosurgery. I'm an outlier, but I, I, I think that neurosurgery has kind of adjusted to me a little bit. Um, if something doesn't feel good um, here and you're questioning it, it's a no-go. Just don't post it. If you're stepping out of your comfort zone and you think that your followers will like it and it's kind of lighthearted, then you should do it. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons we have Joe with us here today is to talk about, you know, politics. Politics is big in social media, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a no-no for the social media handbook. However, there's a lot of, um, healthcare politics out there that are very important that healthcare providers know. Um, and Joe's actually and, an, a kind of an I, I think there's a lot of room for interpretation of the institutional policies. You know, I would agree that institution doesn't want you to put on your Twitter uh, as a Mount Sinai, you know, as an institutional employee, vote for this candidate. But, um, you know, you can certainly comment on health care related issues that are political. And, you know, healthcare is politics and politics is healthcare. Uh, especially now, as we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, every aspect of our care, vaccines, end of life care, LGBTQ care, abortion, agriculture and farming regulations, environmental hazards, gun safety, housing, that's all related to healthcare that we provide. And those are all political topics. And there's sort of been a historical tradition of uh, specifically physicians, because it's the older profession of staying quiet and that becoming political sort of diminishes the prestige of the profession. But I think there's been a huge reversal of that belief. Even the American Medical Association supports uh, physicians who to run for office to speak openly about political issues. If you look at the AMA's Twitter webpage and just scroll down, you'll see vote no, call your congressperson. Um, and our professional organizations are also very political. I'm involved with the New York State Society of PAs. We are a political organization. I do post about PA practice laws, um, but do restrain myself when it comes to a candidate I want to support. I, I don't post that on social media when it's clear on my social media account that I work for an institution. You know, there are risks. You can violate that policy. You can uh, violate a you know patient provider relationship. You can uh, t terminate professional relationships. Um, and potentially, you know, compromise public health programs. There's there's a lot of risk involved, so you have to teeter that line very carefully. So this goes back to my the title of my talk, which is is this a dangerous liaisons or is it actually a love actually? And and I want to encourage the people who are on the fence of joining social media or not that there are probably more pluses than there are minuses. Uh, you can you know you can you obviously have to be careful if you're just starting out. Uh, treading the waters and being uh, politically correct, if you will, but uh, but there's there's much more positives, and when you get a hang of it, the, the avoiding the pitfalls is really actually not that it's not rocket science. It might even be not be brain surgery, um, but. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's definitely a plus. Uh, uh, it's actually love, actually, from my standpoint. Uh, there was one question posed by the audience that I want all the panelists to tackle. Uh, so many of the posts out there are self-promoting and bragging. Uh, is that uh, is that legitimate? What what are the pitfalls there? What are the you know? Oh. Is it gauche? What where, where do we go from there? Are we just selling ourselves out there? I think when you make a post, you have to go, I like to think about it as a hierarchy. Does this support 
Um, Mount Sinai as an institution? Does it support my department? Does it support my position? Does it support me? If it kind of hits all of that, then I feel pretty comfortable with it. If it's if I'm only focused on me, well, then it shouldn't be really a professional post. It should be kind of a, a lighthearted post. Um, you have to ask yourself that question every time you post something. I think there is an aspect, and I like the word gauche that you used. <laughs> Um, and we have been talking about this with the board of the Space Society of PAs about the sort of self-promotion on social media and how it can send mixed messages when you're trying to achieve an agenda. So if you're trying to, you know, achieve an agenda of teaching patients about, I'll take from neurosurgery and prisons or, you know, head traumas and seatbelt safety laws, um, and you're posting pictures on that same medium, uh, you know, in a bathing suit, drinking a margarita on the beach, it sort of sends like conflicting messages about your authenticity and also your authority to speak about uh, an important topic like that. Neha, did, did you have I think both, uh, both uh, Joe and Leslie touched upon this. I think it's very important, the clarity with which you want to send your messages out. Are you staying true to that message or not? And whether your post is going to be perceived, particularly when you're when you're posting about, and there are several posts that that people will share when they're sharing their publications or what their research uh, team is doing or clinically what they've achieved. I think there's there's a graceful way in um, there's a graceful way of doing that and staying true to who you are and your team. And I like uh, how Leslie is very clearly outlined a hierarchy. I think for each one of us when we're using a platform knowing what we want to do with that platform and what is that post going to do? And is it true to that? Is it genuinely uh, in sync with the message we want to uh, want to provide? That consistency is important. Right. And I yeah. think from, from a neurosurgical side, posting, you know, uh, unique cases and whatnot, it, 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 it can come across as, as bragging a lot the time but the one way around it is that if you do have a track record make sure that you post your good results along with your complications if you you know if you're honest with uh, hey you can learn from this complication and this complication as well as from this good result and this good result then you become much more balanced you no longer just say ha ha look at what look at what i can do look at what a master i am but really your your, your message against being true to the message, I'm out there to, to, to teach. Uh, this is what can happen if you did this, this is what you happen to do that in a very balanced way. Justin, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it definitely can be self-promoting. I think you need to be careful uh, with what you post and the things that you wanna draw attention to. And you can certainly do that um, by praising your team, praising past experiences, pra uh, praising something novel, if that's what you're trying to do and share. But I always um, like to highlight team members in my posts or even highlight successes of my colleagues so I'm not only posting, you know, my cases or my experiences. I know that I think that helps to uh, garner more authenticity um, with the things that you're putting out there. Uh, and I try to do that a little bit with hashtags or tagging particular individuals in general. I think even uh, Leslie's um, uh, homepage on or her profile page on Instagram is drawing attention to her passion, which is neurosurgery and it's Mount Sinai um, neurosurgery. So those are important ways that I think you can um, take yourself out, uh, away from being the sole focus and promote something bigger than you. Yeah. All right, we're past time. Uh, we just got the, the bell, if you will. Um, uh, Dr. Bettison, would you like to wrap it up? Uh... No, you should, uh, you should do that, but uh, you really organized a wonderful meeting. Well, I, I didn't do any organizing. Chris Kellner has, has to take the credit for that. But uh, thank you for all the panelists for being here and your thoughts. Uh, let's get out there and do some more posting and uh, educate the world and get our message across. So thank you very much for everybody attending. Uh, I have a webinar tomorrow if anybody wants to jump on my uh, platform and see that. So thank you. Thank you, Mount Sinai, for having us. Uh, have a good thank day. You.